Welcome and good evening to the May 21st, 2024 regular board meeting of the Las Virgenes Unified School District. I have nothing to report out of closed session. Our first item is the flag salute, and I have from Chaparral, Julieta, and Renata, who are going to lead us. Take it away, girls. Please stand. <laughs> Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Nice job, girls. Uh, first order of business, approval of tonight's agenda. I move to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 Do we have Mr. Lawrence back yet? Okay. Uh, approval of minutes, and you will note it's minutes for both April 16th and May 7th. I'll move to approve the April 16th, 2024 minutes. I'll second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. Thank you. And again for May 7th. I can move that we need Mr. Lawrence here. Right. You can you can we, second we, it, Andy. I can second it, but we, we need to vote. We don't have we need him here to vote. Oh yeah, you do. You have yes. Three people, yeah. Okay, let's skip that. We had two board members <laughs> absent, so they they will abstain from voting. We'll we'll come we'll circle back. Okay, staff board communication, Dr. Stout. Madam President, uh, we have three wonderful recognitions to go through. I would recommend that we do our um, outgoing and incoming student board members, then our employees of the month then our new administrative team members, and then Chaparral. Best for last. Does that sound acceptable? That sounds great. All right, if we could have uh, Miss Ella Walsh and Miss Leighton Westerberg come on down to the microphone. So we have student school board members, so the young, youngsters in the front row here might think about this someday. Uh, so we have student board members on the board and their student voice, they represent you, all the students, TK through seniors, and we so appreciate their senior voice, their student voice, and how it shapes our thoughts and decision-making process, and so they are valuable, valuable members, and they are board members. And so we have one that's leaving us, one that's staying, and a new one coming in. So we've got Ella Walsh as a senior, uh, at Agora High School, and she'll be taking off and sharing with us where she's going and what's going on in the future. And we've got Leighton, who's a sophomore at Calabasas, and we're excited that she is staying. But we want to recognize you both for the last year, appreciate your service and your leadership and giving us that all-important student voice. Ms. Cutbill. Yes, as Dr. Stepp said, uh, our student board members are terrific. They're engaged. They really represent uh, the students well in this district. We're happy to have that voice, but they put in a lot of time. I mean, if you think of all the things on a high school student's plate these days, uh, all their extracurriculars, their studies, and they still manage to do this, and they come to even more than just the board meetings. They attend committee meetings and a lot of things that go on in the district. So we're very honored. We're lucky we always get two terrific ones, and we're sorry to see them go, but we love to hear what they go on to do, although I know you're going to be around so look in on for us. So first of all, we have Leighton. Thank you so much. I had a great year. I'm excited to be back. And thank you all for being so kind and sweet to me. I really appreciate it. And Ella, Ella Walsh, we're, we're very appreciative of all you've done this year. Uh, I'm going to George Washington University. Um, <laughs> um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone. You guys were amazing. And also, I really appreciate when you came to the school. That was so kind, and you didn't have to do that. And I just I appreciate all of you and the work that you do. Thank you. And um, we want to take a picture, but before we do that, Ella, we'd love for you to introduce who will be stepping in as a student board representative from Agora High School. I am very excited to introduce next year's student board rep for Agora High School. It's my friend, Matthew Gelb. Um, <laughs> uh, Matt is 
on improv with me and he is one of the funniest, kindest, most engaged people who just always has a question and like will always, but always has the most like intricate, interesting questions that make people think what they hadn't thought of before. Like it's never wasted. Um, and he's just, just an incredible light to be around and I'm very grateful that he's next year's student board representative. All right, if the board could come on down, we'll get a picture with our two outgoing, well, one outgoing, one continuing student board reps. There are also, while, we, while folks move around, there are two birthdays in the room. Matt is one of the birthdays. Happy birthdays, happy 17th. And Dr. Seifrey is also. They, they look about the same age, by the way, isn't it? Dr. Cyphers, we have two outstanding um, employees we'd like to recognize, and so we'll bring you on down uh, to invite those employees and their principal up to the podium. Madam President, members of the board, each month LVUSD uses our core dispositions of perseverance, fostering a collaborative community, and uh, always exhibiting a positive mindset to recognize our employees of the month. Uh, this month, I uh, couldn't be more honored to present to you our classified and certificated employees of the month. Uh, they share the quality of being outstanding and building relationships with students and also being incredible uh, focus on their staffs of always putting in extra time to support our youngsters here in Las Virginas. Uh, Ms. Colwood over at uh, White Oak Elementary School, you can always uh, tell how appreciated somebody is when we come to surprise them and like the whole staff was eager to join us along with about uh, 40 to 50 kindergartners that went absolutely crazy uh, for you. So she's one that's absolutely uh, treasured over there. Uh, and we also have uh, well, uh, Mr. Hackett over there at Agora. Um, anytime that uh, I go to Agora to see an activity, uh, a uh, performing arts or an athletics event, he's there. I'm not sure uh, if he ever leaves the campus, but we appreciate all that he does over there. <laughs> Uh, so we'll hear from him in a little bit, but for now, we'd love to have uh, Ms. Smith to the podium to share a few words about Ms. Colwood. Hey, Madam President, Board, Cabinet, Dr. Dan. Um, today we have the absolute joy of celebrating Kim Colwood <laughs> as our Employee of the Month. Um, Kim not only is a phenomenal campus supervisor and instructional aide, but she is also belo a beloved superhero to our kids from TK through fifth grade. She has a remarkable talent for problem solving and running fantastic small groups filled with very fast moving small people <laughs> and making sure that every child feels supported and engaged. And our kinders and our first graders wanted to make sure that I tell you this, so to quote, you are really good at teaching kids new stuff. You care a lot. Congratulations with helping and supporting a lot of kids and people. You earn this ROAR Award. So a ROAR Award is an um, award that we give for being respectful, optimistic, accountable, and resourceful at White Oak. And they said, you definitely deserve this ROAR Award. So um, another thing that really sets um, Mrs. Colwood apart is that her radiant positivity. So every day she brings joy and energy that uplifts us all, and you make every day better with your cheerful spirit and unwavering dedication. So thank you for everything you do and everything you bring to us, and we are better for knowing you. Thank you. Congratulations. So, Kim, on behalf of the board and the entire district, we are so grateful for all that you do for students and that you work so hard to make a difference every day and that you do make a difference. And we are really honored to, to note you tonight and, and how much you do for our kids. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, board members, cabinet, and Dan, thank you so much um, for this award. I wholeheartedly accept it. And it was really special when y'all came to White Oak to surprise me. I was, I was 
completely surprised. And what better way to do it than with those little TK and kindergartners who just bring smiles to my face every day. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. And I'd like to thank um, Nicole Smith. She is um, a great principal. She leads. Um, her leadership and work ethic is infectious, and I constantly strive for excellence. And to be able to work around someone like her is just makes me be work even that much harder. And the staff at White Oak is absolutely phenomenal. Um, the teach all the staff is wonderful, but the teachers make it really easy to work with. They are um, just special, special people and bring such ease to the table. And so I'm really, really grateful to you all. And um, I'd like to thank my uh, loving parents who showed up tonight. Um, they have raised me with very strong values and morals and um, have showed me that character is very important and have instilled um, strong work ethic and so um, they have always led by example, so I'm really grateful to them. And I also have my loving daughter here who just means the world to me. Her name is Cameron, and my son could not make it, and my husband could not make it, but they support me 100%. And the last thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, to be able to have an, to receive an award like this for something that I'm so passionate about is, it's pretty cool, it really is. I come to work every day and those kids just bring such a smile to my face and um, when I'm out on the playground, I just, I really try to teach kindness and show them how to get along and when there's conflict, um, we go through conflict resolution and how to speak up for themselves and bring the two that are having issues and really speak their mind and um, that's my objective out on the playground and then in the classroom, at their level, I try to just really instill the importance of an education and that it's the key to their future. And um, I work on their self-worth and their self-esteem and to follow rules. And you know, if I can go home every night and know that maybe I reached one of them or made even just the slightest difference um, in any of them, then I know that I'm doing something right and it is really, really satisfying and feels awesome. So. I wish all of you a wonderful evening, and it's good to see students here in the front, too. <laughs> good luck to you all. But you all have a nice evening tonight, and um, again, I'm really honored to receive this award. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite Mr. Lepisto and Mr. Hackett to the podium. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, it is my honor um, to share appreciation and celebrate Mr. Bob Hackett. Um, Bob has been teaching for 35 years and has had such a positive... <laughs> and has had such a positive impact on so many students uh, over his time as an educator. He's been at Agora for 11 years as a music teacher for us. Um, and we want to thank Bob for his commitment and devotion to the AHS music program. The musicians show up ready to perform, even at a national level, as displayed at this year's third place accomplishment at Jazz at Lincoln Center's Essentially Ellington competition. Um, fun fact about Mr. Hackett, he was a student teacher at Agora in 1988, and we were so fortunate that he made his way back. Congratulations and well-deserved, Mr. Bob Hackett. Bob, I don't know any better way to say this than you bring music and joy and light to our students, to our schools, and to our entire community, and we are so grateful for you. You know, it's funny, even in 1988, I didn't have any hair. <laughs> but Chad had uh, a lot darker hair <laughs> 11 years ago. 
Thank you all for this incredible honor. I'm truly blessed to have been provided the opportunity to collaborate with such fine teachers, administrators, parents, and above all, amazing students. I am humbled. Thank you, Garrett Lepisto, for your support, friendship, leadership, and allowing me to say your name wrong for 11 years. Yes. Uh, Aaron Dobson's not here, but uh, we've been in the trenches over the past two years on trips and just in conversation. Uh, he's the voice for me of reason and compassion, and we've had some wonderful deep conversations. Both the Agora High School and A.E. Wright Middle School music programs, I also teach at A.E. Wright, have challenged me to be the very best that I can be. Everything I do is for the students. My goal is to consistently make them shine. It is not about me. Every acknowledgement that has continually been about, let's see, we get that. Every acknowledgement has continually been about our wonderful students. And Mr. Chad Bloom has been my friend and co conspirator in the musical journey for the past 11 years. The talks that we've had, the challenges, the conquests, the physical and emotional growth of the program, the pandemic, the rebuild after the pandemic, and the continued resilience of AH music, AHS music and AHS in general. Through it all, the journey with my friend and fellow music educator has been well worth it. And I also get to work with great co-music director over here at A.E. Wright, Daniel Proctor. He's amazing, and I'm always the recipient of his outstanding teaching. The jazz band at A.E. Wright is among the best out there. As I reflect on 35 years of education, I realize that my work is not finished and that there are more goals to be realized. Chad, you know I have five more years, right? <laughs> How many years have I been saying that? <laughs> at least five. <laughs> With, with Chad moving up to VAPA coordinator, I understand the responsibility of moving the AHS music program even more forward. I will do so. Chad has taught me and continues to teach me so much. I'm ever thankful to be a part of this district. Thank you to the cabinet, Dr. Stepp, my fellow expendables, the LVUSD school board, and to my family and friends. Thank you to my great friends and family, Melody and Justine Holguin are here with me tonight, and Tony Moran for being here, all, being there all the time for me, and also for my cats. I, I have my uh, <laughs> pandemic cats. And uh, you all started out as band parents and students. Uh, back in you know, 20, 25 years ago, you became my friends, and you became my second family. The recognition here for me is humbling and a bit overwhelming. It is much easier for me to fly under the radar and do what I do. I am at my best when the students are at their best. Thank you all for this surprising and magnificent honor. If the board could join us down here for another photo. And we've got two um, staff members who've been with us for quite some time, but stepping into new leadership roles, we want to introduce them tonight. There are two gentlemen here tonight. Mr. Chad Bloom, come on down, Chad. And um, from the previous recognition, Mr. Bob Hackett, as you mentioned, he's part of the Expendables. Without Chad and Bob, the Expendables would have long expired. So we appreciate uh, your participation in that. So you're good, you're good. I'm just talking about you for a second. You're good. Uh, 
So Chad Bloom is stepping into a new leadership position for us. We're excited for him in this new role. Um, as Bob Hackett mentioned, he's been with Agora Music since uh, tw 2004, so 20, uh, 20 years or so at Agora High School. Go Chargers. He's conductor of the choir, wind ensemble, jazz bands, orchestras, uh, performing arts department chair since 2013 to president. He's present. He's coordinated successfully, executed several student performances um, in our performing arts education centers. He's established, as we just mentioned, a nationally recognized jazz band program, and he was also Las Vegas Teachers of the Month. Uh, he's got a master's degree in single subject music from Lehman College in New York, bachelor's of music in jazz performance from Cal State Northridge, go Matadors. Uh, so we have excited to share that Mr. Chad Bloom is joining us as our visual and performing arts coordinator, Ms. Cutbill. Chad, uh, we're just excited for you in this new role and uh, really excited to see all the great things that we know you, you have done and will continue to do for the district and the performing arts. And we know that Agora Music is in great hands with, with uh, Mr. Hackett, but we're thrilled to have you step up to the Performing Arts Center. So. Uh, Madam President, distinguished members of the board, Dan, uh, my colleague here from Agora High School, Mr. Lepisto, I got the name right today, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oakman, Ms. Brock, Mr. Dobson, who's not here. Um, everybody has been so incredibly supportive of uh, me in the last few years as I um, emerged from Center edX learning about something I had a passion for outside of music, but I kind of fused the two, leadership and music. So. I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do that and my um, administrative staff for allowing me to have uh, some freedom to pursue those interests. And of course, Mr. Bob Hackett, who I've worked with for so long. He said he's learned so much from me, but I've learned so much from him. And we, we have been through it in the last 10 years. And I'm really happy to go and support all the programs of students in the district to um, maybe realize and discover more about what they can do in the visual and performing arts. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I want to introduce my amazing wife, who um, I'm always gone on so many trips and concerts, and she's so supportive of me doing that and well in the new role, too. Uh, Xander, who's a first grader at Willow. Say hi, Xander. <laughs> and this is Elliot. He's a second grader at Willow, and he was he's very excited to hear the choir or the vocal group sing. So yeah, <laughs> he's waiting for it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Mr. Bloom, you have a chance to scout some talent tonight with this performance from Chaparral in a second. I do feel like I've been living a bit of a lie if I'm not saying Lapisto right. Lapisto. Lapisto. All right, I'll try to stop living that lie. Wow. Uh, Jonathan Oakman, come on down. Uh, Jonathan uh, stepped in ably uh, when we had um, the beloved principal of Agora High School pass away. Uh, principal Lepisto also stepped in as well uh, through those challenging times, and so we greatly appreciate that. A little bit about Mr. Oakman. He's got 15 years of experience teaching AP physics uh, and physics. He also deigned himself to teach a slightly lower science, chemistry, a little bit of robotics in there as well. But uh, I, whenever I see a fellow AP physics teacher, we're few and far between excited to, excited to see that. So 15 years teaching those difficult classes at Modern Day, Oaks Christian, and more recently at Gora High School. He's been lead teacher, department chair, LVA site rep, uh, instructional coach for Center edX in our induction program, and as I just mentioned, interim dean and assistant principal since January 2023. He's got a master's of science in chemistry. Um, uh, MS in Physical and Analytic Chemistry, Bachelor's of Science from Cal Lutheran Chemistry also. Uh, and so Jonathan will be taking over, um, shifting from the role of interim to a uh, more permanent position of assistant principal at Agora High School. Ms. Cutbill. Thank you, Jonathan. On behalf of the board and the district, we're just thrilled to uh, formally welcome you from the, into the role of no longer interim, but as AP, a job that you're doing terrific at, and we're so happy for all the things you're doing at Agora. Madam President, distinguished members of the board, 
cabinet, Dr. Stepanowski, um, my admin team uh, at Agora, Mr. Lepisto, Ms. Brock, and Mr. Dobson, who's not here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, really the continued opportunity to be at Agora, a place that I've been at eight, for eight years now, and I really have fallen in love with going to work every day. So having that continued opportunity is uh, really, I have a lot of gratitude for that. I uh, want to thank my wife, Karen, who and my kids, uh, Everett and Cora, who are unable to be here tonight because of kid baseball. They're at <laughs> baseball practice. Uh, but I want to thank them for their continued support. And uh, obviously, I, I greatly want to uh, just thank my admin team members for supporting me in this journey. Um, it's been a whirlwind for the last uh, year and a half in, an, in the admin world, but I look forward to a, a lot more uh, fun with the team. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Phew, chaparral. Well, we finally made it. Thank you, you've been angels and so patient. We appreciate that. Principal Goldstein, come on down. What do we have going on? Hello, thank you, Madam President, Board, Cabinet, um, for welcoming chaparral students to serenade you all for Steve Cypress's birthday. Um, <laughs> These are eight amazing, incredible humans, and they're all leaving me in 15 days to go to AC Stell. Um, but I'm so fortunate that I got to lead them for the last two years. Um, I'm gonna let their talent speak for themselves. So we have Mira, Kaylee, Renata, Roma, Molly, Lola, Ava, and Julieta, and they're gonna sing a song from The Lion King for you. We're going to begin our regular board meeting, so you're all welcome to stay, or my recommendation, head on home and enjoy each other and celebrate those uh, students, employees of the month, and new leaders. 
Mr. Lawrence, we're going to swing back and approve the minutes of the last meeting because we needed you. So, um, so I'll move to approve the May 7th board meet minutes. I'll second it. Okay. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? I abstain. I was not at the meeting. I abstain for the same reason. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Continuing on staff board communication, Dr. Sapp. Mr. Klein, what do we got? Congrats to our uh, girls track team at CIF. They are not only Division II CIF champs, which is outstanding, they're ranked 10th in the United States. Yeah, wow. They are, wow. yes. They're going to states here real soon. Uh, they are a fin phenomenal, dynamic group of young ladies. They are. Um, I think we've got the fastest four by 100 in the state of California. So congratulations to these scholar athletes. We recently celebrated our community-based instruction CBI showcase at Agora High School. I believe uh, Ms. Mengus, I think, was there with, uh, with us. Uh, such a joy to celebrate these students. They, they get to take over the main stage and uh, perform uh, for us, sing and dance along with other students from Agora High School. It's really uh, one of my favorite events of the entire year. This is the finale where they're all on stage singing. Here's two students doing individual um, performances. Top left was a solo on the piano, which was outstanding. And bottom right was sharing um, inspirations and a little bit about his family. So CBI showcase at Agora High School. Um, Fariva Albert has put that together. I think this was our sixth annual. Um, always a joy, and I never miss it. We've got some folks from the foundation here, so we want to celebrate this and promote this. Come on down. The best party in Las Virginas. Uh, don't miss it. June 8th at the Canyon Club. Be very exciting. Uh, Casino Royale. And um, again, the foundation does outstanding work, um, raising funds for all 15 schools, all students of ours in all 15 schools, TK through 12. They're the only organization that can impact us in such a broad uh, way. So we appreciate their leadership, their hard work, and um, them putting on this event. And uh, can't wait to be there. I've got a table reserved. Any guarantees on winnings? <laughs> That's a lawyer response. It's excellent. Okay. Congratulations to Las Virgins, and really, we're going to save the rest in some money. So with, um, with our bonds, we periodically, our financial advisors will review them, and if there's a refinancing opportunity, we'll take it. And so far, we've saved the residents uh, in excess of $12 million. Part of any refinancing process is getting rated by Moody's, which is a rather deep dive into our finances. Um, takes our uh, business services department and our CBO, Dr. Gleason, quite some time. The presentation he and I uh, were a part of was um, maybe gr grueling, grilling, grinding. Is it too harsh? But it's pretty close. It's, um, they really do look at our finances closely. Fortunately, our board's direction has been one of prudence and um, being fiscally conservative. Um, and so that showed in our innovative revenue streams and our collaboration of our rentals of our facilities and some of the dynamic programming uh, that we have, including the Center for Educational Excellence and the revenue that that brings in, along with our enrollment bump. So we received the highest possible rating at AA1 and next slide, Jim. If you are curious what the ratings look like, there are all the options Moody has, and we're right there. Uh, the only districts that get AAA are basic aid districts. There's only two of those in LA County, so that's not even an option for us. Only 10 districts in all of LA County, there's 80 districts, even receive a AA1, so we had the highest possible rating. And again, that is a direct reflection on uh, the direction the board sets and the hard work from staff to maintain a very strong and conservative fiscal position. Congratulations. And I just want to take a minute to congratulate you, Dr. Stefanowski, for your leadership and uh, Dr. Gleason for your stewardship and your leadership. You have not been in this position for very long and for get, to get this kind of rating really shows your um, skill and creativity and, and your level of commitment and your brilliance, so thank you. Yes, thank you to both. Thank you, Dr. Stepp, and thank you, Dr. Gleason. And each slide gets more and more exciting. Uh, the Education Results Partnership in California for quite some time has been putting together an honor roll. And so we had three schools make the honor roll. These are the top 15% of schools in the state of California. And so White Oak Elementary, Lupin Elementary, Sumac Elementary, congratulations to those three schools, outstanding. They achieved this by 
having 80%, so if I can get this right, 80% of their subpopulations score uh, significantly above the state mean, which is outstanding. So they are just crushing it in 80% or more categories within their school. So that's exciting uh, to have that many. We'll leave it there. Okay. Sometimes I, I, com I make comparisons, but we'll just, we'll just stick with the facts. Let it sit. Thank you. Uh, that concludes staff communication, Madam President. Okay, thank you. Ms. Westerberg. Madam President, members of the board, Calabasas has been very busy recently. We finished AP testing last Friday. Also on Friday, we had our second multicultural banquet of the year and our commitment day for our seniors. On Saturday, seniors had their prom at the Majestic downtown with the theme of Casino Royale. This week, our We Made Too Many Yearbook sale is going on. Um, today at lunch, we have our final signing day of the year. We, congratulations to all athletes who uh, committed today. Also this week, we have CAPS testing and ASB commissioner interviews. Coming up, we have our final Spirit Week pep rally music concert and performance. Seniors have their senior activities at Universal, a beach day, and a movie night soon, along with a Spirit Week. Last Friday, Agora held a 3v3 basketball tournament, and before that was Film Fest, which went incredibly well. This week is a Spirit Week that includes Tropical Day, Surfers versus Lifeguards, and ends with Commitment Day. Beach Day is next Tuesday for all seniors as an award for winning the Spirit Competition. Agora High School is having their first garage sale next week. Members of the community donated last Saturday, and the sale will be held on June 2nd with lots of children's toys, clothes, stuffed animals, and more. Thank you. I just love all the exciting things going on at the end of the year. Uh, Ms. Stein. Thank you very much. I also want to just congratulate Ella and Leighton for being student board reps this year because it is, as Mrs. Cutbill said, a big commitment and we really appreciate you going above and beyond and um, learning and asking great questions. So thank you and welcome to Matt. Is he still here? Yes, he is. Welcome to Matt. You'll be sitting next to me soon enough for a little bit. Um, Lucky Matt. Lucky Matt. And <laughs> Hey, no words from the peanut gallery. Okay, and uh, <laughs> and uh, this is open house season, so I want to say that uh, this this week, I think it was this week, was it the other night? I was at Willow, whenever I was, whatever day it was, and it's always so much fun because our schools have turned these into um, really community events for their school community, and the you know, hordes of people in classrooms. I tried to say hi to every teacher, but getting to them is very hard. The amount of work that goes into these nights, the teachers, the creativity, the artwork, the projects, the writing, the math is amazing. And it's always fun for me at the end of the evening to see the parents have to physically drag their kids away because they really are just love school and love being there. So thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Ms. Gaines. Thank you. I attended the Calabasas Chamber Education Committee last week, and the guest speaker uh, were our librarians. And I want to say that they have a summer program for kids and adults, and it's free to everyone. Uh, don't have to be in the city. Uh, I think they're even featuring, I think Captain Sito is coming out with a book. Um, I think they're featuring that. And um, so check their website. It's free for all ages, and they encourage you to register just because they do fill up and they try to manage the number of people they have. And they did want me to let the student reps know that they are looking for some volunteers in the library this <laughs> summer. So either school got some students who would want to volunteer for some community service. <coughs> They're looking for volunteers. And I think that's it. Thank you. Ms. Mingus. So, um, as Dr. Stepanowski mentioned, I was at the CPI showcase at Agora High School, and it is um, heartwarming to watch those students perform. They're so proud of themselves when they're up there, and after, they're so nervous before they perform and so proud that they've done it afterwards. Um, and then also, um, I was at Round Meadow for their uh, back to school night, and it was so great seeing the joy on all of the students' faces. They were so proud of their school. They were so proud to be there. Um, I got to walk around with the principal, uh, Principal Exner, and I um, visited almost all of the classrooms, and she showed me they have a brand new maker space, and it was fascinating to see um, the projects that they had worked on in there, and, um, and just they have a lot of great things going on. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence. Nothing to share. Thank you. Uh, 
I'll just echo people's comments that open house season is great to see everything going on. And a very special shout out to Lupins because they had the farm open and parents were heading back there. And a little um, props to Ms. Leslie Timbers who's heading up the gardening effort back there. And parents were so excited and so engaged about the transformation of that space. So that was terrific to see. I also attended the um, California Suburban School District uh, quarterly meeting where we find out all the <laughs> terrible I bills coming out of Sacramento um, and what we're going to do about them. But it was, um, and mostly talked about the budget, which I know we're going to hear more about later. So that's really it for me. I have no um, speaker cards, so no comments from the public for items not on the agenda. So we'll move on to consent A. I'll move to approve consent A. I'll second. I um, actually have a question yeah. on the BP 1330. Okay. Pull that for questions or I don't, however you want to handle it. We can, uh, however you would like to do it. Would you like to approve every item but that? Either one. I just said. Well, a ask your questions. I think okay. we, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in reading, Dr. Gleason, the uh, board policy, um, trying to pull it up here. It seemed to me that there were different tiers, and upon the initial reading, it looked like tier one had special rates for PFCs and Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. The boosters seemed to fall in tier two. So it wasn't clear to me that they had, were getting, I mean, it's clear to me from that <laughs> that they're getting a, a little higher rate, and is there a reason for that? And what page is that on? And, and the pages are not numbered, so. Be the second page of the policy. Uh -huh. So what's tricky about this policy, and I, I appreciate oh, the question because I, I do think it's unclear, it's not as clear as it could be, is that it depends on how the booster or the PFA or the 501c3 is utilizing the facility. If they're utilizing it for regular business to support uh, with meetings that are not for, um, that are not affiliated with camps, then they would definitely should be a tier one. If it's a summer, if it's a 501c3 offering a summer camp that does not fault solely, that is a fundraiser does not solely involve LVSD students, then it would be a tier two. Do the so, booster groups do that? Do they have like summer programs do, uh, that sometimes. make money? Sometimes. Booster groups do? They do, especially in athletics, you'll yeah. see okay. it. Yeah. So. Whereas the PFCs never do. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, so if, if, if the board agrees, I think with the great question, one thing that I might recommend is that we add language in the facility use fees section to talk about to, rem, uh, to share how uh, affiliated boosters and PFCs have no fee for regular meetings, and two, to clarify that boosters would fall under tier one if operating the same way as a PFA. So would you change the policy with that wording? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I would, further, I would further clarify the intent and scope of use. So I can pull it and bring it back if we do do that. Um, in the or, policy, no. you're saying add language in the policy that uh, we're voting on, or in the actual schedule. Or, yeah, or in the actual fee schedule. I think the schedule is more clear than the policy is. That was the schedule that we're voting on tonight. I, I would. We preferred to vote on the policy first than the schedule. Agreed. So we need to agree on that language. I think. Yeah, and I think we can change the language right now very quickly. Yes, I think we can right? too. And then just vote on it tonight. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I just don't want the boosters or someone taking a quick look at it and saying. Right. No. Okay. It's uh, yeah. That's the difference. Is that yeah, sometimes they can fall into that. Right. Okay. And that <clears> so if you can amend it to the way that you said it, and then we can. Um, Sure, I would add boosters under uh, tier one. I would clarify the booster language under tier two, and I would add a sentence on the front end. These are all small things, but add a okay. sentence on the front end to clarify that boosters and PFA, okay. PFC groups who are conducting meetings have no fee. Okay, so I'm gonna ask for a motion right. for everything except 1330. You can come up with some language because you're magical like that, and then we'll revisit that in a, in a, in a couple minutes, okay? 
Does that sound? Because I think we can agree on that. Motion to approve that. as amended. Thank you. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Consent B. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, are we going to come back to this consent AI? Yes, we're right? going to, he's going to give us actual language so that we can have uh, clarity yeah. on, on what that, okay. that change sorry. is and then, and then vote on that. Right. We're, we're mixing up the agenda tonight. We're having a little fun. Okay, consent B. Thank you for keeping it all, all straight. Keep it, keeping, your, <laughs> keeping it. I move to approve consent B. Thank you. I second. Okay, board only vote. Aye. 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 Thank you. Action items. Uh, and here I'm going to move up a couple things because I know we have people here for items four and six. So I think I'm going to go to item four first, if that's okay with everyone. Whatever move them ahead. Pleasure. Approval is. of master agreement with the foundation. Dr. Seth. Madam President, members of the board. Excited to have the foundation with us. We've got President Mark Madnick, Vice President Monica Parmar, and Treasurer David Rice. You're welcome to come to the podium if you'd like to. Uh, we deeply appreciate their support, their engagement. These folks work really, really hard. I get to see that on a daily basis. And they've been innovative in some of their events and programming recently with the very successful um, Battle of the Bands and now Casino Royale uh, tonight as well. I think we, um, I think, um, President Madnick mentioned that our master agreement with him hadn't been touched in 10 years. Um, what, 14? 14. <laughs> I was going to okay. say. I, I undersold that one a little bit. <laughs> and um, he is a renowned and accomplished attorney, so we appreciate his eye on the agreement. There are no concerns. The relationship is fantastic. But uh, when you've got an agreement and it hasn't been looked at in 14 years, I think it's prudent to take a mm -hmm. look at that. Uh, Dr. Gleason? Dr. Stepp, you really covered it well. I, uh, <laughs> the uh, the board in the agenda packet has the red line uh, copy. You can see um, some of the changes were just names of individuals that have transitioned out of their uh, roles. Other language uh, just really clarifies uh, a process of appointment of a, a designee to the foundation to ensure that they're receiving all the appropriate staff support, as well as uh, providing them the f financial information they need to close their books are largely uh, the changes that we brought forward, but Mr. Madnick will cover any details that I overlooked. Yeah, um, just really briefly, if I could, um, we are just, uh, we're always just so proud and honored to be able to be, you know, to run this foundation and to support the district. Um, as matters currently stand, we've got four tent pole events that we're conducting every year. Uh, it's great to see you all there, trying to raise some funds uh, for all the students to support mental health, uh, you know, class size reductions and whatever else um, you know we work on together um, that we uh, that we can to help to help students. Um, it's always kind of a, a joke every time we uh, we have any any incidents that go on on our board, but we always remember that what we do this is for the kids. Um, so um, it's really uh, you know, and it's an honor to work with all of you. Um, and we uh, I have to give credit to Treasurer David Rice who joined our board last year and uh, did a deep dive and realized that uh, our agreement with you all was kind of out of date. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and we went through and we just, you know, we updated some dates, um, provided just, you know, more cooperation um, between both of us to make sure that um, we're communicating appropriately with you, district is communicating appropriately with us, which assists us in our fundraising efforts as well. Um, and uh, you know, because I am an attorney, we also added in a nice dispute resolution mechanism. Um, again, as Dr. Stepanowski mentioned, we get along great, um, but uh, sadly, we can't all be here forever. So uh, in the event that uh, anything does arise in the future, we put in uh, a mechanism where everybody can work things out, hopefully, um, and, uh, and, and again, do it for the kids. So um, if there's any specific questions, happy to answer them. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Dr. Gleason, as well. Uh, this has been an effort that we've been undertaking for almost a year uh, to get this right, so. My, my only comment about actual language is it talks about a cabinet member and a board members being assigned when school starts. And our reorg is always of committees is in January. Now, that doesn't mean that language wouldn't apply. We would just give you a different name mid-year in January. So I'm not necessarily asking to change the language, just the clarity that that's when the board does committee assignments. 
And the other thing in there is it says one school board member. We have two school board member liaisons. So if we can change the one to a two, and um, unless you it's, only want one, unless you only want one, right? We we'd love to have all. <laughs> so but good answer. Usually our practice is two, so we can change. Yeah. The the other thing is um, it says on an annual basis, no later than the beginning of school instruction. Um, we don't use that term. We use the beginning of the school year, something like that. So if we can make it more consistent language to what we use, the beginning of the school year, and um, to Miss Cutbill's point, it says on an annual basis, no later than the than the beginning of school instruction, will appoint one now two school board members. Um, it does then, I guess. January works in that language, but I don't know if you want to make it more specific to say January. When, that's when we rotate. That's yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. 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 And um, yeah, those were mo only my two points. Was the beginning of school instruction to keep it to the beginning? Yeah, those were mine. And and Mr. Madnick, Mark, I just want to thank you and and everyone for all that you do. They are fun events. You raise money. It's a heck of a lot of work, and we all appreciate you greatly. We do. Absolutely. We very thank you. much appreciate. And what's the H for? What's an H? <laughs> My first name is Harris. Oh, I like that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. You're welcome to call me Harris. Yeah. My parents named me that and never actually called me Harris. So. <laughs> That's Harris. my story. And I just uh, sitting on the committee as one of the board members, just want to emphasize also that it's such a collaborative group. We yes. appreciate everything all the time um, that you put into it, and it's really a pleasure to work with with all of you. Thank you. We we really appreciate working with all of you, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, you all in. Two weeks. At the yes. yes, two weeks. I think yes. we all have our tickets. Yes. Nod, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Looking forward to June eighth. Would <laughs> okay. the board like to for staff to make those changes on the day, or would you like us to make changes and bring it back as consent? Oh, no. I'll make a motion to approve as amended. Yes. I think I'll we second can make those changes. I'll second. Thank you, student board member. Aye. Board. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you for all you do. To, yeah. All right. Okay. Madam President, I do have updated language. If you do want to, let's, <laughs> yes, let's go. Let's go right back into 1330. Just, item three. Mr. Yes. Klein, I have just shared a slide presentation right. with you. The magic of technology. look at how speedy you are. Oh. Miss Patterson, I'm sorry, unanticipated slides. <laughs> Fifteen seconds ago. I just shared the uh, the policy, the visuals. I can read them out loud too. Google Docs. Uh, uh, it's a Google PowerPoint that's uh, or a Google Slides that says updated language. We're watching data transfer in midair. <laughs> Apologize. Um, we could walk it across the room faster. We can hang on for a second here. Right? All right. Oh, thank you. So I highlighted in yellow the recommended changes so the board could visualize and amend if needed. Uh, apologies for. Can Mr. Lawrence see that or do you need to send that to him? Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I added the line under facility use fees PFA and affiliated booster groups conducting meetings related to school or district business will receive access to the facilities at no charge. Okay. Next slide. The use of facilities shall be granted at base fee to the primary parent fac uh, primary or parent organizations and recognized booster groups at the school site under tier one. And then part two, or tier two, or the last part, I just took off on the next slide, uh, tier two rates. I took off booster groups because um, the 501c3 status utilizing right. and the other language would cover that. Okay. So. Uh, Dr. Gleason, can you go back to the first slide question? Are all, are all, dumb question, are all booster groups 501c3s? Yes. All booster groups that are affiliated with us are 501c3s, yep. They should be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So PFA and affiliated booster groups, it should be PFA slash C? Told you that, Steve. All right. <laughs> and affiliated booster groups conducting meetings related to school or uh -huh. district business. Yeah. Okay, so I'm running a camp. They're mostly our students, or all our students. That's business, but I'm making a profit. No, it's not it's a meeting. Not yeah, meeting is the key word there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. 
What if they have uh, a meeting? Well, so that's, that's an interesting. Ms. Stein's point's a really key one, though. That's right. a, what if they're having a meeting ahead of their camp or their whatever they're doing? So the, we you, you have used similar language on our mm -hmm. facility use fee schedules in the past to delineate a PFA meeting or a PFC meeting or a booster meeting related to the direct work of the district as opposed to utilizing the facility for a camp, for a fee, for a fundraiser, for a non-intended use. So why can't we put that in there? having a meeting, and that might be one item on the agenda. I'm still OK with that. At least there's some yeah, okay. differentiation. Yeah. OK. So, so if a booster group wanted to do um, trunk or treat, for example, on a campus or the uh, garage sale, we would still charge them to use the parking lot facilities or the meeting or the meeting room for that particular activity under the tier, the, 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 the second tier. Um, but if they had a meeting to plan for that in a classroom, we wouldn't charge them. Correct. Okay. What if it's sorry, last question. What if is there I, so one, I appreciate all the work that's gone to this. I really think there's been a real concerted effort to make sure that if, if the if the sole focus or the the primary focus of the group utilizing our space is to support LVUSD students, we're trying to make it as cheap, if not free, as possible. So I think I, that that's the perfect guiding principle to have. So thank you for all the work you've gone to kind of think through that with all the differing pieces that are coming at you. Um, what what is the instance where um, uh, it's a Trying to think like it, it's a there's no cost to the district. So, for example, if they wanted to use the parking lot for a garage sale and we didn't have to have any facilities fees or things like that, are we still going to charge them for that? Uh, or is there a way to say, like, you know, the most you'd have to cover is our cost? I'm just trying to think through like those those times where there may not be any cost to us but it's not for a meeting, it's for something else. Is there any scenario where that might happen in your mind? No scenario. Uh, tier one, it really is the, uh, based on factoring in all the costs. The reason is, is there's no such thing as an event that doesn't have one. Even in a parking lot, you would have custodian on campus in mm -hmm. case a fire alarm went off to make sure that yeah. um, oftentimes if a parking lot's used, a restroom would be used. Um, we need to clean it up. Uh, use of a parking lot often has trash or waste that would need to be emptied. So it's really all those factors. Okay. Again, thanks for all the thought into this. I appreciate it. I will entertain a motion to approve. Okay, I'll move. I move to approve um, a, re a revision to board policy 1330. I okay. second that. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, action item. We're going to go to approval of peer tutoring course. Ms. Patterson. Madam President, members of the board, it is such an absolute pleasure to bring you this course proposal recommendation, which was approved by Curriculum Council um, on Wednesday, May 15th. Uh, Mrs. Brock and two of our amazing Agora students and advisor Karen Inglis are going to present to you. I, I do want to um, just let you know that board member Lawrence said that this was the best slide deck he had seen <laughs> in LVUSD. So, so that you'll really be ready for it. And then they need the control. And I think the students did the deck, right? That's they the did. best part. The students they did the did deck. And they like to control the deck. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Stepanowski, cabinet, it's my absolute honor to be here tonight. Um, A, to get to celebrate Agora High School in multiple capacities. That was exciting earlier this meeting. But really tonight to get to share with you hard work put together by our incredible teacher advisor, Ms. Karen Inglis, and three of our amazing peer tutoring students, two of whom are here tonight to share with you about our proposed peer tutoring course. So I'm going to let them take the lead. Um, but join me in welcoming Ms. Inglis, Noah Krieger, and Lillian Spratt. Members of the board, Madam President, Dr. Stepanowski, thank you for having us today. Um, so peer tutoring is something that we started a little bit over a year ago. And basically, it started off as a club. And over the last year, we've seen it really expand and help across our campus. So just a couple things to share with you today. 
So of course, Ms. Brock already introduced us, but again, Ms. Inglis, I'm Lillian, and this is Noah. We are gonna be like the cabinet for next year. I'll be director and she'll be assistant director. Okay, so we have a lot of different forms of peer tutoring. So our biggest main one as of right now is block morning tutoring. So Tuesday through Friday from 7.30 till school starts. We are all together, all of the tutors and all the students. And then we have support tutors going in and basically they can just sign up to go to whatever supports they want and basically be embedded into a class and just help out. And then we have intervention tutoring for the DF list and it's for algebra one, I believe. And then we plan a lot of study sessions for upcoming tests and we have also sessions on like how to use a calculator and just th stuff that we think is beneficial for high school students. And then we also do tutoring at Lindero weekly and we are trying to also expand into a right. So as of May 3rd, which was a couple days, more than a couple days ago, we had 700 students, but in the last two weeks, we've had another 250 more students come in. So now we're at around 950 students coming in throughout the year, um, which is an amazing number, especially because of our tutors. And our tutors do so much, so we want to thank them for that. So a couple of things, I'm gonna try and go back real quick. A couple of things that we're looking for with this class is giving our tutors NHS recognition, which is the National Honor Society. This will basically open them up to more scholarships for college and is a great um, thing to write college essays about and really will just expand their horizons on how to tutor and how to become a more well-rounded student. Um, so we are looking to make it a class so that those students can also get credit for a class <coughs> and, being, and are actually able to be in the center for more days a week rather than just coming in on their own time. So yeah, I kind of just went over that. But why do we need a class? It'll guarantee that tutors will be there to help when we need to. Oftentimes we'll have 20, 30 kids come into the center, but often we'll only have five to 10 tutors. So that's not enough. So by being a class, we will make sure to have enough tutors each morning. We'll also uh, rearrange timing to have tutors available during support and seventh period, especially with the different schedule next year. It's gonna look a little bit different to, uh, teens are not going to have as much time to ask for help in their specific classes, so we will be a, another avenue for them to get that help. Okay, so making it a class would give us more opportunities to help teach our tutors, and we wanted to do this through a series of modules. So module one would really be working on one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is asking appropriate questions and really determining what the problem is, seeing what subject or what specific topic the student is struggling with, not necessarily just algebra two. And also strategies that are showing them how to do it, not just doing it for them. I think at this point, we've honestly gained the reputation that peer tutoring isn't the place to just come if you want answers. Peer tutoring is the place to come if you wanna learn and you wanna actually understand. And I think that's what we've been doing. Module two is leading small group study sessions. So a lot of times we'll do a study session for bio and we'll have 50 to 60 kids come in to learn genetics. But a lot of times that doesn't necessarily help every single one of those kids. So we're looking to get smaller group study sessions so that we can connect more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's awesome when we have a couple kids come in for just a random Tuesday morning and they want help with geometry and we can make we can put them in like our boardroom and it's like five or six of them, and it's kind of like much more personal, and I think that that's what makes them come back. Also, managing different learning styles. Um, my, I myself have experienced some people are more visual learners, some people are more um, like auditory learners, and I think being able to really connect one-on-one -on -one with each and every student in those small group study sessions is really helpful. Also, behavior management, a lot of times, reasons why kids aren't doing as well in classes aren't just because they don't understand the material, it's because they have ADHD, dyslexia, all this stuff, and being able to work with them to find either A, other methods to help them focus, and B, just being able to, maybe they just aren't motivated, maybe they don't need to have an art class or a science class, maybe that's just not what they're interested in, so 
being able to have them realize that, yes, this is not something that you might love to do, but it's gonna make you a more well-rounded student in the end is something that is really helpful for each and every student. Okay, so module three would be strategies for different study skills, and that would be focused a lot on note taking. We find that a lot of students have struggles with taking notes and actually learning how to do that in an efficient way that also helps them understand the material and remember it. And so just being able to use those notes to study and really understanding how to take different notes for different subjects needed. Finally, we have module four, which is creating review activities. Um, a lot of times, teachers have so many resources that students don't know about. So for example, you might just have one math review sheet for Algebra one, but a lot of times students don't realize that they can ask for more or they can use their books. So um, being able to have a compilation of all that, such we did last year, but just growing a little bit more on that. And then also just for our tutors, they are coming off of two months of summer, not doing algebra one, not doing geometry, not doing English. Um, and so in those first couple weeks of the class, making sure that they remember how to do factoring and remember how to uh, write a synthesis essay and stuff like that. So we can do that through practice problems, games, flashcards, just kind of tutoring them so they are better tutors in the future. And also practice test compiling and taking practice tests so each and every one of us understand the material that we will have to teach later. Okay, so the other things that we would try to do as a peer tuning class would be having a lot of writing workshops because we find that for English it's more helpful to have stuff that's more focused around writing than tests. And then we want to continue planning a lot of study sessions and that's pretty much just a few days before a test, we'll have a bunch of kids come in, offer the same subject, and have a few tutors that are all there and ready to tutor that subject. And we just will sometimes do a kahoot, or we'll answer any questions, do practice problems, just go over whatever they need. And then we also plan to be there at Back to School Night and the Eighth Grade Showcase. And we are collaborating with our middle school tutors to just keep helping them out however we can. One thing to add about the middle school tutors, with our already uh, curriculum at the Lindero and hopefully right next year, being able to have those kids being able to recognize our logo and our students coming in as incoming freshmen, then they'll be able to feel more comfortable to come into peer tutoring because, oh, we already did that in middle school. And then what is National Honor Society exactly? So there are four pillars, scholarship, service, leadership, and character. Each of those helps build both the people in honor society and also the people within who are coming to get help. So what does it consist of? 60 hours per semester. This is less than it would be in a class, but it is a lot for tutors just coming in in the morning. It is almost every day in the morning. Most tutors get around 20 to 30 hours right now. So being able to get those 60 hours, which is almost just a class, why not just make it a class and let them get some extra credit for it? Also, um, it would also look like in the morning, so how it is already, 7.30 to 8.20 in the morning, and then support on our Tuesday and Wednesday, and then also, again, reaching out to middle school and perhaps even elementary schools, which elementary schools can look like um, there is the careers in ed, the careers and ed class right now, which we're looking to kind of jump off of, and because a lot of times those, a lot of times those kids come in, and they go into those classes and they realize that they stay more than just that class. So if they are logging hours outside of their careers and education class, then they can uh, also get them for peer tutoring, and they can help those kids, which again go into middle school, which go into the high school level. If you have any questions, we're more than welcome to take them now. Thank you very much. That was great. Good job. Board, questions? I have a question. I have a few, actually. What a fabulous presentation, and what a wonderful um, initiative that you want to do to help students uh, achieve more success in school. So thank you, and thank you, uh, students, for taking this leadership position in this role. It's very admirable, so thank you. Um, this, is this going to be offered this fall at both high schools? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So the intention would be that, yes, it could be offered at both Agora High School and Calabasas. We've been working closely with Miss Diana, who's 
my equivalent AP of CNI at Calabasas, and Kristen Lapiner, who's the teacher leader for their peer tutoring program there as well. Um, one thing I wanted to add that I know our students mentioned was with our new bell schedule next year, um, students will have for lack of a better term, like a release period in our one through seven model, right? Students still take six classes. We have seven periods throughout the day. So this peer tutoring opportunity will also be really beneficial for students who need to stay on campus if their release is the start of the day or end of the day and there's concerns with parent drop off or pickup. Um, so it will be offered at both sites uh, and Calabasas is really excited to jump on board with this program. And so being that a core, a class, you think a class, okay, it meets, you know, the same time, the same days. So this is very fluid. It's not like you're all going to be together in a class. <clears throat> is there ever going to be a time when the peer tutors are together in a course, in a classroom? Yes. We are looking at a variety of different things. Um, part of NHS requires that we meet monthly to maintain standards. But the other thing that we have implemented, the girls have decided that is important, is making sure all of our tutors are on the same page. The first two weeks of every school year is a pretty fluid movement around classes, but there's also not a lot of kids who are looking for that extra need. They're just back at school and excited to meet their friends again. So we hope to use at least the first two weeks as a really strong push to get everyone together to train them for whatever they're looking for doing, whether it's intervention training or working in the supports, which are a little bit different than working before school, or even at the ele um, elementary and middle schools. So we're looking hard at the first two weeks, but we are going to do monthly based upon their NHS stuff. And um, so NHS, is there a GPA requirement to, uh, to be a not National Honor Society? No, not okay. technically in terms of, I mean, yes, there is, but it's not really for us. It's, it's a very low GPA. Okay, good. But okay. We don't, what we're looking for are students who can reach other students who are struggling. Right. And it's not necessarily going to be our 5.0 students. It's going to be students who can connect with other kids. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our tutors are the 5.0 AP IB honor students, but we have a lot of students who come in and they're looking for somebody to connect on a different level with. So our first question to them is not what is your GPA? Our first question to them is what classes have you taken and what are you comfortable with? And from there we look at are you able to work with students across the subject matter and, and how do you interact with students and as opposed to what grade level did you get in these classes? And I know we're going to be applying for an A through G, uh, have this be A through G accepted. Um, is this a semester, a year course? And how do you keep track of students that are actually doing this so they can get course credit? It is a year long course because our students need help year long. How do we keep track of it? We have our tutors sign in daily. We have our students who need tutors sign in daily so we can cross-reference who's working with who. When our students come in to get help, we have them come in through our sign-in registration door and we place them with the tutors. We have them tell us what subjects they're most in need of and we bring them to someone who is going to help them. We often have a lot of kids come in and ask for a very specific tutor that they've worked with before. I get a number of emails, can you please make sure so-and-so will be there because it really, really helps, especially as test days come. Uh, we have finals coming up in just a few short weeks and I've had a lot of, are you guys gonna do a study session? I need this kid, this kid was really great. So we, we try to pair them up with students that they've been <coughs> successful with. On the other side, students who aren't as successful, we do, I do talk with them and we look to make a better arrangement. So and I have one, one last question. Can Sorry. I add in one yeah. quick thing that I think will help clarify too? Students who are in this course as peer tutors will be rostered with Ms. Inglis okay. in class sections on her okay. like caseload, if that makes right. sense. Right, okay. Yeah. And um, since this has been a club for a year and a half, have, are you keeping any data as far as have, has the DF list uh, reduced? Ha are you seeing, you know, with real data, students increasing their achievement levels? So yes, and um, we've talked about it internally as obviously there's some issues of confidentiality when right. we don't want to dive into like specific student data to share publicly, but we have seen improvements, especially in our math cohorts that have been working in small groups with our peer tutors, especially in Algebra 1, um, which is great and we want to see that and we want to continue to see that. And then with the new Bell Schedule next year and the implementation of common collaboration periods with our teachers, we can then take time to dive into that data with them so they see the benefits of our peer tutors and bring students in for peer tutoring um, study sessions for their support periods for their class as well. So yes, and that's continued growing work. Thank you very much. So 
I just want clarity. When you say 700 students have signed in, are you talking 700 unique individual students? Are you talking uh, 100 students came seven times? Like, just what does that mean? Um, so um, that is our total number. Um, now, they could come in every day a week, um, but that is, in my perspective, how many individual times we've reached someone. So those 900 kids may be, in reality, 400 who've come in twice. Um, but I feel like each and every time they come in, they get something different out of it. So in my perspective, I take them as a different student, as even though they might have this even though they might in person be the okay. same student. Thank you. Okay. I'm tagging on to all their great work, but I'd say administratively as well mm -hmm. with our follow-up in students, whether it's a discipline circumstance or a concern about missing assignments or grades or anything, we've recommended attendance to our peer tutoring in the morning and seen dramatic shifts um, in that student uh, performance in their, in their overall classes. So that's a great purpose okay. as well. And, um, I was at the Curriculum Council when you guys presented, and you did a fantastic job, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you did mention at Curriculum Council that the people that are the tutors in the peer tutoring class are interviewed by you all and selected. Okay, yes, yeah, so our application process is there's a written application, and then me, Lillian, and Miss Inglis um, do an interview with every single person who wants to be a tutor, and we just make sure that they have the qualities that we're looking for in a tutor that can reach other students in a beneficial way. Thank you. And one of the other needs that they brought up was that um, they were hearing from other students that, um, that were tutors that um, they realized that they didn't necessarily know how to tutor that they, and they wanted to get away from giving them the answer and seeing if they understood. Any other questions or discussion? So, Ms. Patterson, um, can you keep the board um, informed as to the A through G process and acceptance, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 I don't think we ever approve anything that has no cost and no facility. <laughs> <Yeah>, right. <laughs> I would just like to say that's. <laughs> From a fiscal standpoint, pretty jazzed about that. But thank you for what you're doing for students. Appreciate the thoughtfulness and the approach here and, and the time and the dedication. So thank you. And now we're going to go back to something slightly more exciting. <laughs> Lease agreement with Sharp Electronics Corporation for digital copiers. Yay, new copier. <laughs> yeah, you want to run. <laughs> We're doing now. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, not sure how to take that. I'll take that. Uh, we are, um, as the board knows, we are engaging in, uh, we've engaged in an RFP process with multiple copy, uh, uh, multiple agencies providing copy services, uh, submitting proposals. Uh, we went through a thorough review, scored each proposal, the top three finalists. Uh, were interviewed. You might wonder how do you interview a copy machine. We actually bring the copy machine here. Three different uh, machines were brought here. They were tested by our staff, uh, independently rated. And um, it's not often you have the highest quality output uh, recommended by our tech department and uh, those who utilized it also have the lowest cost. And that is where uh, we land tonight with the recommendation that the board approve this contract with Sharp. Um, a couple notes on the contract first. Uh, it outlines uh, the contract is in accordance with the RFP that was um, uh, issued. S second, um, our Canon copiers, the reason we, one of the reasons we need to move on from them right now is uh, not only are they at five years of age, you just killed the room, our last audience member. <laughs> the copier <laughs> Uh, not only are they five years old, but that's where copy machines start to require a lot of maintenance, but also uh, there was no provision in the contract to extend uh, one year at a time, which is what we included in this. 
agreement should the copy machines still have some life uh, left in them. If the board approves, we'll engage in a fast process to uh, do a swap -a across the district, which means Mr. Klein's team, who's been integral in all of this, will be very, very busy. Um, what I've learned in this process, you can't just plug in a copy machine. They have to be configured, aligned, and um, there's a lot of opinions on prefer preferred settings. Yes, I want to Motion to approve. A second. Thank you. Question or, th or question. Uh, so there'll be no interruption in service? They'll all be ready to go when school starts or when teachers and staff are back? There'll be no interruption in service for um, our school sites. There will be a small interruption in service for our district office. Okay. Sorry, district office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, student board member? Aye. Board. Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Moving on. Proposition 28 annual plan. Madam President, members of the board, uh, we are uh, very lucky and grateful to have Proposition 28 passed by our voters. Uh, Proposition 28, uh, with all the right intentions, um, per will provide our schools with additional support in the areas of visual and performing arts. The challenge we have with Prop 28, with Proposition 28, is it has some very tight regulations as it was uh, signed into law and. Some of those regulations include 80% of um, all expenditures can uh, have to be spent on personnel, 20% on non-personnel costs, that the board needs to certify and authorize an annual report of how the expenditures are utilized. Um, the audit guide uh, for this year, even though we received the full year apportionment, the audit guide did not come out till March, so guidance across the state was to not spend until the audit guide came out. Um, we can spend any fiscal year's funds within three years. Therefore, this year we have developed a carryover that can uh, um, be utilized over the next two fiscal years for this year's allocation. Uh, the plan you see before you tonight is um, really outlines uh, what uh, student, uh, the number of students served this year. You can see based on the audit guide coming out late, we spent most of, uh, most of the funding this year was spent on um, uh, instrument replacement and cycling, um, and uh, just to just to hum a few more bars on the instrument repair, we'd love to spend and appropriate more funding towards that. But the eighty twenty rule has is limiting, and then we have outlined the plans for next year. The plans for next year include um, being able to sustain um, some of the one time fun uh, COVID funded elementary visual and performing arts, as well as we had a, a robust. Um, and multi-meeting collaborative process with uh, VAPA leaders and Mr. Chad Bloom uh, to set up the secondary plans to help support um, everything from instruments to field trips to stipends to uh, coaches all outlined in the plan. Um, the state requires that we adopt and up upload a plan and that is on the district website. They gave no template or guidance on, as to how the plan should look. So we did our best estimate to uh, look at the trailer bill and see um, what's required. And this is what we have. And uh, probably in future years, there'll be more of a sophisticated uh, plan attention. Discussion? Can we know how elementary money is going to be spent next year? I know we spoke about consolidating some of the specialists so as to not encroach on the general fund. I'll uh, kick it to Ms. Davenport to hum a few bars just in terms of the program. Um, as the board knows, when uh, post-COVID we received federal money, one-time money, and part of um, coming out of the pandemic, uh, it was important for students to be able to reconnect and re-engage as, as they had been isolated at home. Um, but that money only lasted for three years, and we knew at the time that the money uh, had sunset, we'd need to make challenging decisions. Um, Prop 28 was passed, which allowed us to um, consolidate those nine FTE into four and a half FTE. And Ms. Davenport has a brilliant plan. So for this coming year, the elementary schools will be each provided with an elementary uh, certificated VAPA teacher that will provide both visual and performing arts in the, uh, either the first or second semester um, of school. So they'll either have uh, visual first and performing second or vice versa. Um, just in contrast to last year where they had uh, both uh, at the schools. 
So uh, the schools and are fifty percent. You said fifty percent. Fifty percent of what they were experiencing last year, um, and some schools are choosing to supplement uh, additional support for VAPA uh, using other funding. But uh, we're happy that the district's able to provide these certificated teachers for next year. Have all of them been have, hired? Uh, they have all been hired, but one position, a part-time position, remains open at Chaparral. I was just curious about the allocations. I'm looking at slide number three. There doesn't appear to be a consistent, um, or at least one that I can read, um, rubric for the allocations per student served. So you have, for example, um, Willow with 539 students getting $74,000, but Bay Laurel with 470, what was that? I'm sorry, uh, with, uh, excuse me, uh, Chaparral with 599 mm -hmm. getting 10,000 less. What, what, how did we land on, I would think it would be dollar per student. Was there some other methodology used here? I believe the unduplicated count is uh, considered. We pulled these numbers directly off the CDE apportionment schedule. So um, I uh, had uh, assumed similarly that it was a per student, per pupil allocation. I don't know how the unduplicated count or three-year averaging would uh, factor in, but um, one of the big, th one of the important parts of the statute is that the sites are supposed to develop their own plans as well and have autonomy and how they utilize this fund, these funds with um, some form of district approval. So we did not set the allocation. So the fact that that Chaparral, for example, is getting less per st per student per dollars than Willow was set by the state of California. Uh, that was set by the state of California, correct? I'm gonna, I'm pulling up the plan to see what you're seeing. I'm just, looking, I'm just looking at the slides. There's, I, I, oh, I, I can't see what you're saying. Any, 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 any rhyme or reason as to the, as the funding because it's all over the map. Some schools have more, some have less based on students. I can't figure out how we tag the funding. So I see what you're seeing. I apologize. I didn't have it uh, up in front of me. The student served column is student served this year. The allocations are based on prior on prior year enrollment. So the. Um, and, and possibly with the unduplicated count factored in. So Chaparral has grown significantly in the last year. So there's more students served based on the prior year allocation. We, okay. the 23, yeah. the allocations for 24, 25 have not been released by CDE. That's why we carried over the same amount. The state is requiring that we up, update this plan and get board approval on this plan, um, I believe in the next couple of months. And so we're chasing we're constantly chasing the regulations with respect to Prop 28 in order to be able to implement it. So we haven't. I'm sorry, go ahead. We haven't been funded yet for 24-25. Um, when does that funding come in, or how does that funding come in? That comes through the uh, principal apportionment that uh, is released in the fall. So will those be based on 24-25 numbers, or they'll be based on 23-24 numbers? Right. Okay. Okay. So. I'll make okay. Sorry. No, uh, Mr. Lawrence, you raise a good point, and it is confusing so, when it says students served. Um, so that's current numbers. That's not okay. That's interesting. That's yeah, the the statute, as we understood it, said to report to the board students served with the type of programs and the total um, amount allocated. It did not say to um, outline what the plan is for next year. We included that anyway, okay. just okay. in case that we missed something in the audit guide. So I realize that you guys are jumping through lots of different hoops in order to spend this money because there's so many restrictions to it. And um, although it's a, a smaller uh, portion of it, but I, how difficult will it be to spend the money in the appropriate way with Elvis? Because that's such a unique school. Yeah, Elvis and Buttercup, um, we, I, I'll, I'll work with Ms. Falcon um, and Ms. Davenport next year to really determine how we can best utilize that. So, you know, Buttercup is supposed to get their own allocation of five or six thousand um, dollars. So it, much is it? it it's not much, but the, the thing that's just wild is that eighty percent of it has to be personnel. So when you parse down an amount yeah. that small, yeah, it makes it really tricky. I don't know how you. So Buttercup's not even on here. Um, it's not. We we rolled it into YB. I was going to say, can yeah. we roll it in? Can can these students get some of what YB? is doing? That's the plan right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Elvis is trickier. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. Approval of facility use fee schedule. Dr. Gleason. Dr. Shep. Who wants to? <laughs> Madam President, members of the board, uh, as, uh, as, as was illustrated earlier tonight, we refined the uh, uh, board policy and administrative regs uh, th uh, 1330 over facility use. Um, we originally brought this to the May 7th meeting and then brought it tonight for approval. Uh, this is the updated schedule that aligns with uh, that policy. Um, and uh, for our nonprofits that are serving students in our district, for our, um, our affiliated uh, groups, they, these rates mirror what they would have been under the old schedule with 3% increase. Um, the recommendation of the board, um, the language that you see at the bottom of the schedule mirrors that in uh, the board policy 1330. Um, you'll see the 3% annual posted on the schedule. We did, um, uh, and we did consolidate from the old schedule um, a few items in terms of stadium and stadium lights. Um, and uh, we made, made, it's important that we made clear that the existing pools are listed here, especially as we engage in a major construction project yes. at Agora High School. So happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, recommendation for the board is, as you see in the agenda item, to have these rates go into effect January 1st so that we have time to communicate with our uh, partners and because we have facility users who have, are already renting for summer and fall and setting their prices accordingly right. in the spirit of being good partners. I, speaking for myself, I feel I've looked at these numbers enough and we've hashed them out enough in committees that I have no questions, but happy to entertain any other. Just assume for the most part these are hourly rates? Yes, these are all hourly rates. Um, in that top left box on the table, it, um, could get lost because it doesn't have the color. Yeah. Ryan, I, it's a little confusing when it says we're approving effective January 1st, 2025, but the actual fee schedule says 2425. Do you want to change the actual fee schedule or put somewhere in there effective? Yeah, we, yes, we can definitely do that. Okay. Um, we always want, or I shouldn't say we always want, what's helpful is that because the 3% rolls annually at the fiscal year conclusion, yeah. We'd want fee schedule 25, 26. Right, so we just okay. have that weird lag. Okay, well, okay. We can definitely add that language though. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is a more global one. So these, you know, we know in the economy today, as it is, costs and expenses are going up, right? Everybody, the cost of doing business for school districts and many other, most businesses are going up. So these fees, do they represent our costs? Are we losing money on these? These fees are adjusted in accordance with market rates. Um, the tier one fees are uh, calculated to ensure that um, all direct costs are captured with no additional funds. Um, really direct cost capture is based off of current day prices. So what we've seen with uh, turf replacement like at our high schools with how much use that the depreciation far exceeds um, what the uh, normal life schedule is. Um, so we have adjusted these to try and not lose money um, as well as stay uh, uh, parallel with current market rates. Right. And so for the record, that's what I want to get on the record is the district is um, not making a profit off this. We have to keep up with expenses, try to meet our expenses with these, and we are being uh, good stewards of the district's budget by increasing these fees. Absolutely. I just have a question, if, if I could, maybe help me. Um, so one, reiterate my, reiterate my previous comments, appreciate the focus on trying to make sure we're not um, making it uh, an insurmountable goal for groups that are focused on helping our students. I'm trying to understand, so if, if I am a student, when I see things like district approved enrichment for groups serving only LVUSD students versus a majority of LVUSD students. So if, if, if it's an after-school enrichment program being run at, a, at, a, at an elementary school and it's a nonprofit that charges a fee, but it's a nonprofit and 95% of the students are, are the, the kids are students at the school and it's brought in by the PFC, is that a tier two or a tier three in this, in this billing? 
we don't have any enrichment programs that have other students that I am aware of. Um, what are, are you familiar with any? I mean, I, I could see, I could just, or, or let's just say like, so where is the after school enrichment program that is hosted at a school campus that is a not profit, but charges a fee um, and is serving our, is that, so that is your, that's the third bullet under tier two? District approved enrichment and after student providing only for all of these students? Yeah, I'm puzzled on the question because we have our, all of our district approved enrichment has a joint use agreement that is separate from this fee schedule where this would be relevant or uh, maybe a, um, a case that we, we would see more as a summer enrichment renter who's a 501c3 serving a good portion of our students but bringing in uh, kids, athletes from other districts. They, that would be um, a tier uh, two, right. depending on the scope of use. Right. Okay, so any, I just wanna make sure I'm, I, I'm understanding the language correctly. Any after school program, say sponsored by a PFC, that is, this is primarily for elementary schools for, for this example, I think, um, that is arts, music, theater, whatever it might be that they bring in, that is the 501c3 nonprofit, they would fall under tier two. Correct. Um, uh, uh, the something that we have engaged in, and, and uh, we've talked about this in finance and facilities committee over the last couple of years, is um, th there was a model at one point where aftercare providers could coordinate directly with the schools, and it created um, challenging issues to manage, largely for human resources in terms of fingerprinting and facilities in terms of making sure everyone was approved. So we worked really hard last year to make sure that we have enrichment providers that the schools and the, fa uh, and the families utilize but have a joint use agreement that is separate from this fee schedule. The joint use agreement uses the fee schedule to calculate their rate, but they're not, we don't have an enrichment provider that is um, at the elementary schools that is going into Facilitron for a la carte use. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the fee schedule. Thank Second. You. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 Thank you. You have a new fee schedule. All right. Uh, nine through 12, core ELA core literature adoption. Ms. Patterson. Madam President, members of the board, uh, I am bringing forth to you a high school core literature adoption text. And as you know, we went through a very exhaustive process where uh, Ms. Johnson led a review of all of the collection and included in the slides for you today is just a very brief um, description of the ways that we review books and we are looking for books that serve our diverse students and that also reflect our students and illuminate other experiences for our students. Our English department at Calabasas uh, brought forth this text for review. And as you know, books must be read and scored by at least two ELA teachers. So in this case, we had two English teachers from Calabasas and Agora who were very interested in teaching this text in the future. They scored across 16 categories, and there they are for you. Um, and the books must be scored um, at an approval rating, and this text was. The text is called Nearer My Freedom, The Interesting Life of a Laudu Ikwanal, and it is an autobiography. It's brilliant. It's an 18th um, century um, autobiography about a man from Nigeria who was enslaved here in the US, eventually bought his own freedom, lived in London, and wrote this book, which became really seminal to the emancipation uh, of slavery movement across uh, England and the US. And the teachers were so interested in teaching this because they have an excerpt in their study sync uh, literature, but it's so important for them to also teach deeper works to prepare students for college. And they, um, so they recommended this uh, curriculum council 
um, approved it, and I am bringing it forward for your approval. I do have a question, just not with the content. We, usually when we do core literature, we do a lot of books. I've never seen us bring one book, so I'm just curious. Yes, the, uh, there was such a generous review of books last year that moving forward every spring and fall, the English departments have discussions about are there any texts they'd like to bring forward. They're actually <laughs> reading another um, book this summer that they may bring forward to Curriculum Council in the fall, but this is their only recommendation for this year. Okay. And how in addition to what has been approved. Right. This is this is adding on to the list, right? Correct. Adding to the list. So is this a supplemental title that they're going to supplement with? Because they do read certain books um, in each grade in, in high school. So this will be, if they if they will choose to supplement with this book? It would be taught at the junior level. Oh, okay. If they, if they choose to use it. But they have the choice to do it. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, any other questions or? Uh, I'll just make my usual statement. I, I would love at some point to see a book brought forward um, in one of our larger lists about m more books about the American experiment of democracy, our founding fathers. I think we finally got one last year, but it was Killing Lincoln by Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> not exactly the book that I would have, I would have hoped for yeah. to come through the process. But there's just thousands of books that are far better about well, the, the great American experiment in democracy yeah. and why it's great sure. and all the things that were that, that we did as a the founding father. So I'd love to see one of those come through before I retire from this board. You're just a guy with a dream. I know. Yeah. It's silly. I, know. I, I, I agree. OK. Uh, I'll move to approve the uh, Near My Freedom, The Interesting Life of the ELA core literature adoption. Thank Jeez. you very much. The slide <laughs> went away. I'll second. <laughs> second. Thank you. Student board member? Aye. Board? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Information items. Now it's picking up speed with the May revision, <laughs> which was the focus of our Cal SSD meeting. Sadly. Madam President, members of the board, the, well, the Economic picture for the country looks relatively positive. Um, state of California is a bit of an outlier and a much more complex picture. Uh, for school districts, I've shared with the board some articles recently about s districts like San Francisco Unified that are, I suppose, flirting with or considering or approaching insolvency, and the state is watching them very closely. Um, sort of trifecta of a dramatically, well, a number of factors, the late, the delay in reporting income taxes, um, pushing from a typical October to November, didn't give the state typical heads up relative to headwinds in personal income taxes, the, which caused a dramatic reduction in COLA um, from four plus percent to barely one percent, declining enrollment, and the reduction or the elimination or using up of all COVID funds have created quite a challenge for districts. We've seen districts in the region, Southern California region, laying off, you know, sometimes hundreds of teachers. Pasadena, I think, had over 200 layoffs. Hart was able to pull back on some of the layoffs, but I think they landed on 24. Manhattan Beach, despite extending a parcel tax, ended up with layoffs. So it is a murky financial picture for the state of California. So mm -hmm. we continue to monitor it. Um, as our credit rating earlier suggests, we maintain a prudent and conservative policy relative to finances. Um, but this is the challenging one. Um, our enrollment, uh, in our, our increasing enrollment, um, however gradual, is tremendous for us, probably the life-saving ring, you know, in a number of different areas. First of all, you know, turned around a trend uh, that had us uh, heading downward. Um, so that's a very positive factor. And of course, you know, being conservative financially, but it is, it's a different scene out there. And it's challenging, the, the 1,000 districts in the state get it, but with a national economy that is on a you know, slightly better trajectory, it's, I think our folks and our parents and our communities don't really understand how challenging it is for school districts. I'm not sure I have the better way to put it. Dr. Gleason. Madam President, members of the board, um, I know there's been multiple presentations and digestion uh, workshops that have been provided by CSBA and School Services of California and FICMAT. 
that I know the board is deeply engaged in. So I'll give the, um, the cliff notes tonight and then happy to go into the extended cut wherever uh, you might want. Um, so uh, of course the May revise is just that. It is a revised assumptions based on uh, tax collections. At least this year we did have an April 15th tax deadline so our assumptions are not predicated on uh, predictions as much as they were in the prior year. Um, so Prop 98, uh, this, is, this is the big story of this budget um, in that uh, because of the a delayed tax filing deadline for uh, the last fiscal year, the, uh, it was delayed, as, as the community will recall, until uh, November. And uh, the government or the uh, legislative analyst office and the governor's office got over their skis in terms of their assumptions and thus uh, benched Prop 98, which is the funding that comes uh, to schools, at as, uh, those numbers that you see for 22, 23, and 23, 24 at 98 and 105 billion, respectively. The May revise lowers those assumptions to 97.5 and 102.6 billion. The challenge there, and this is really just the this is the underlying architecture of the uh, governor's proposal, is that they gave us too much money, <laughs> and so then how do you deal with that? And they gave us too much money based off of their assumptions, and their assumptions um, they are human too, and their assumptions were pretty far off. Um, and uh, so I say all that to say, well. I don't want to give away all the great stuff in the first slide, so uh, we'll, we'll build up to it. So right now, the great news, this is different from the Great Recession when we were talking about uh, these economic conditions last, is that over the last few years of uh, economic growth, uh, the Public School Stabilization Act uh, has put approximately $10 billion aside for a rainy day. Um, in order, in this proposal, um, in the January budget, um, the governor was using a more modest approach to withdrawing from these accounts. This basic, this current proposal is uh, withdrawing almost 80% of those uh, funds. Um, so um, pro uh, coming back to uh, Prop 98, the right now Prop 98 is allocated on a number of tests um, and what the governor is, is saying right now is that the money that we allocated to you under Prop uh, 98, that additional money that we appropriated to you that we wouldn't have had we had accurate tax collection data, that's no longer Prop 98 money. But we're not going to issue any deferrals, we're not going to sweep any programs, we're going to borrow from the future. So instead of counting it as our Prop 98 benchmark, They'll rebench us to the amounts that I had in the first slide, and then adjust uh, to get us in the next five years to the point of the current floor that we're at. They will borrow from the general fund. Um, the legislative analyst office has said this is bad policy to borrow from the future. Um, of course, the governor is navigating a significant fiscal challenge, and uh, CSBA and other entities have threatened to take legal action against the governor's office because it is potentially problematic and um, uh, could set a precedent for a governor to be able to rebench a Prop 98 guarantee, which is always supposed to grow, which is, should always grow unless you have economic uncertainty, then an IOU should be in place based on the um, floor that was set. and so. If the Prop 98 uh, guarantee, uh, so under test two of Prop 98, uh, the, the law reads that you must, uh, if, if test one doesn't apply, which is 40% of the general fund, test two applies, which means you are not funded at less than the prior fiscal year. And so uh, there are groups that are saying it's unconstitutional for the governor to uh, reduce the Prop 98 entitlement. Now, every it's easy to criticize, it's hard to find solutions. If the governor does indeed, or if the uh, legislative analyst office and those who think it's bad policy are successful, rebenching Prop 98 to the current threshold, it's, a, it's good for us in the long term in that that becomes our entitlement. 
But what would likely happen in that case is the law reads that the state, the assembly, through a two-thirds vote, can suspend Prop 98, and then um, the state will have to enact some form of plan, whether it could be deferrals, whether it could be sweeping of one-time funds. So it's in some ways, it's the same end, or it's different ends to the same means, at least in the short term. Um, we would much prefer on our side not to have deferred uh, revenue. That, that would be really, that would be tricky for us, but it would be especially tricky for those districts that are on, um, uh, on a walking a fine line of meeting their 3%. So, uh, oh, and the Legislative Analyst Office and the governor are, uh, again, just like last year, not agreeing on their uh, revenue estimates with the LAO, per, uh, assuming that they're much worse than the governor's office. Last year, the LAO was right. I'm rooting for the governor this year, but we should probably brace, too, that the LAO might be right again. So uh, I, I bring this presentation before you today to say we won't know anything until June 15th because we don't have clear consensus data from the state. What we do know is that uh, the governor and the LAO on a good, uh, from a place of good news, uh, want to, or are signaling to want to avoid cuts to K-12 education and are uh, recommending other cost-saving measures such as not filling positions, uh, health care reductions, and other grant-funded uh, programs being suspended. Um, psychology is everything. Uh, for those watching uh, season uh, the twenty four or twenty three twenty four uh, season of um, school finance, we had that eight point two two percent cola. I will always shed a tear for those good days. <laughs> yeah. um, but we were planning on that top line, as the board knows, and we've reported in the first interim and the second interim. Uh, we were planning and built our fiscal uh, model on the COLA that was projected in June of 2023, which is uh, almost 4% in uh, next year and then 3% in the two subsequent years in December when um, the November collections were um, uh, re recognized. That COLA went from 3.94 to 0.76%. Um, and in the out years, it was just a little bit north of one. And that set the table. That, with declining enrollment across the state, a dramatically reduced COLA from what was negotiated by uh, districts, plus the um, sunset of one-time funds, as well as the hold harmless averaging year of COVID, has led to many districts in the state being in some real fiscal peril. We're not there, we're in great shape uh, overall. That is good news. Um, and even better news, when you're expecting a 3.94% COLA and you only get a 0.76, that's sad. But when you're expecting a 0.76 and you get a 1.07, that's good. So uh, it's all about how we look at it. Um, and the 2.73 and the 3.11 are better than we had anticipated. Uh, STRS rates are a flat line. PERS will continue to go up. Thus, the employee uh, costs continue to increase, and that'll be uh, recognized in our multi-year projection during the adopted budget. Um, and uh, a, a challenge, of course, it's not easy when you, um, you are in a fiscal position uh, like the state is. The state is um, seeing much higher unemployment than nationally, as well as uh, inflation does not appear to be adjusting as dramatically as you'd expect with current interest rates. Um, and so a lot of the bond facility bond projects have been frozen, including the TK facilities money that has been promised for a couple of years has been frozen. I want to thank the community at this point for the passage of Measure S and for the board and, and going out because we spent $9 million on TK facilities that would have otherwise hit the general fund and would have had a dramatic impact on staff, students, and programs. So um, thank you to Measure S. Hopefully we can get um, some of that money matched back when there is a facilities bond put on the state level, and hopefully TK infrastructure will be a priority in future budgets. Interesting things in the budget, just interesting. Not really necessarily, this is not relevant to LVSD because we contract with the bus company. Is you'd think during times of cuts, I would think during times of cuts that you would maybe um, halt like green bus initiatives because across the state, uh, mm -hmm. districts are struggling with green buses. In fact, in terms of charging stations, holding a battery life and um, um, operation. And so they, he has uh, sustained an 800, uh, or he has increased the allocation of green buses uh, almost double from the January. So he has worse data, but 
is doubling down on, on these projects. And that really illustrates um, kind of the political dynamics at the state is there's uh, pockets of uh, government right now with the very best of intentions to make movement in areas of uh, climate, uh, also in the areas of aftercare, universal meals, that all have a significant fiscal impact that uh, if swept and returned back to pre-COVID baselines would really help mitigate the ongoing impact of the Prop 98 um, peril that we're in. Uh, also interesting, universal meals, we wondered if this was going to increase. Um, right now, um, spoiler alert for those on finance committee tomorrow, child nutrition continues to build a, a reserve well beyond what is needed because of universal meals and supply chain assistance money. And in spite of that, the governor is increasing 200 million over the January assumptions for universal meals programs. And um, uh, certainly, universal meal program, ELOP, have definitely have an impact in the pockets across the state. Um, but in terms of LVUSD, uh, sweeping those programs would be preferred over operational cuts at the core. Uh, other proposals, we have been very prudent to save our Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant and Arts Instructional Materials Block Grant to allow for a very steady uh, off-ramp from all the COVID money. Um, and so now that we have been responsible with that, the state is saying we need more plans and we should have, uh, we might need to uh, uh, have further plans brought to the board for those two grants. Um, we are using those two grants in the next two years to offset the impact of general fund, on the, of the general fund of um, health, the increase of health and welfare benefits, and as well as um, to pick up some of those uh, COVID costs so that we didn't impact the general fund and we did not need to make reductions beyond natural attrition. You can see on this slide what a 0.76 COLA looks like versus a 1.07% COLA. Not a lot, um, uh, but it's 350,000. Uh, one very important thing to continue just to be very transparent about is we we have built our budget assumptions and will continue to do so up until adopted budget and maybe even first interim off of trend line data for enrollment. So we're at 95.50 right now, 95.60, uh, and we have, historic, we have seen a one and three quarter percent decline over if you look at a um, past five year uh, model. And so we've built our assumptions on that. Um, that said, at the same time, we've been very aggressive in marketing our district and sharing the great programs that we have and um, reaching out to our residents. Um, and as of current, uh, currently right now, it's a safe assumption that we'd be at 97.50 next year. Um, and then if you do a 1% decline off of that, you can see that we hit 97.50 next year and continue to the same downward trend line you'd see a $4 million return on our um, on where we are. But I'm optimistic now. That's the last slide. That's the last slide. So uh, I'm optimistic as of today. Um, sorry, I want more slides. I want more May revise. I'm optimistic as of today that we're probably 98, 98, 50, 9,900 are well within our grasp which could lead to a $7 million um, overall turn in the next few years. Why that's good for us as, uh, as every other district is wrestling with significant cuts and really um, challenging circumstances. This will give us tools in our tool belt to not only um, not see cuts to um, uh, staff, students, and staff and student programs, but potentially have some funding available to help our employees uh, in a district that is uh, funded in the lowest 10% of districts across the state uh, see some type of offer that allows them at least to keep pace with um, the increasing cost of goods and services as well as the increased cost of health and welfare benefits that are planned. So um, if I had another slide, I'd put 98.50 on there. And the reason I thought I had another slide is we have finance committee tomorrow where I have that other slide. Um, and my two slide decks are merging in my mind. So I'll pause there. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. We'll stay tuned for yes. future waiting, info. Waiting for June.
I'm sorry, I'm having PTSD from the Great Recession. The LAO was exactly, and I remember going to presentations by the LAO that, you know, very different numbers than the governor at that time. No, it was last year. They had very different numbers. They were fighting it out. Uh, revision to board policy and administrative regulation 5113, absences and excuses. Ms. Falk. Madam President, members of the board, board policy 5113 was last updated in 2001. The corresponding AR was last updated in 2009. The proposed revisions include um, revisions to the law, which include the absence for the benefit of a student's mental health as included as a reason for an excused absence where it was not before, and an absence for student participation in, in a cultural ceremony uh, also included as an excused absence. And then the AR includes a list of 15 items that are now considered to be excused absences, keeping in mind that we know excused absences do not count toward our ADA, but do count for students to be able to make up work when missed. Right, allows you to, uh, okay. Seems straightforward. Any discussion? No? Quick question. Do excused absences count towards um, attendance rate in general? They count as against us. Against so excused and unaccused are counted the same. Okay. Correct. Okay. Board policy 6158, independent study. Madam President, members of the board, uh, audit guides continue to evolve with respect to independent study and ADA calculations as well as student interventions uh, coming out of the pandemic. The intent of those regulations is to ensure that uh, the district has um, tight paperwork, that we are uh, providing ongoing support and interventions for student independent study, and that we have active outreach should students not be showing up to um, uh, participate in their independent study activities. This language was shared uh, with us um, by our auditors and asked to be included in our board policy so that we can continue to count independent study ADA into our apportionment. So I have some, uh, um, mainly, they're all mainly related to, there's like a paragraph into the, in there under general independent study requirements where it says for the 2021-22 school year, I think that whole paragraph can be struck out and then the paragraph right below that, it says for the 22-23 school year, you could strike that out and just put, um, start it with the superintendent. You know, and, and it happens a couple of times during the document. Because I know most of us 10 years from now don't want to think about the 2021-22 uh, school year and what a headache <laughs> all of that was coming out of the pandemic. Do you need to have all that old language in there? No, we definitely don't. And, and since this is info tonight, we'll, when we bring it back as consent, we'll update okay. that. Yeah, I would have sent you an email beforehand, but I figured. It's a nice time capsule um, that I will look forward right. to deleting. <laughs> If you want to keep it, keep it for for, <laughs> for historical purposes. Okay, moving on to revision of board policy and admin regulation 6173, education for homeless children. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, uh, board policy and AR 6173 were last updated in 2013 and there have been considerable revisions in the law since then. I had the opportunity last week to spend two days at the state conference for homeless and learned many fascinating things. Um, so this update reflects a lot of those new laws in place, which really lay out the framework and the supports that a district needs to provide for a student who is considered homeless, starting with there's now a universal um, questionnaire that the state has issued that all districts should be using in determining whether a student meets the homeless criteria. Um, there's updated transportation obligations for district. Um, enhanced identification process supports that districts need to uh, provide. And also include also the inclusion of when a district has 15 or more students who are considered homeless, that we need to include goals and specific actions on our LCAP to address um, that homeless population. So there are considerable, uh, considerable updates to this and I anticipate judging by what I learned at the conference and the next year or two there will be more revisions coming out as the state's homeless population continues to increase. Okay. Do you have a number of how many students, homeless students we have? We currently have 30. 30. I was going to guess 30, exactly 30. <clears throat> of course, that, that includes a definition of right, like they might be staying with a friend or, right? So the definition, which yeah. has changed since it, we first started doing this, they have to lack a fixed, permanent 
So if they're living with a friend, but it is considered a fixed and permanent, they right. would not qualify as homeless. Where but previously staying they did. with on a temporary basis Correct. would. Okay. It could, right. yes, it could fit that criteria. And the county makes that determination? We do. We do. Um, a parent has a right to appeal that. And it goes um, to the county. And it goes to the county. Um, if, if we deny their, um, well, that's why the questionnaire is so great, because it's a universal questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So the county would basically be revoking their own questionnaire that's been adopted by the state if a, we determine a stu student is not homeless, but the county does. Okay. Okay. Well, if there's no further questions, I will bring the gavel down on this meeting. Have a good, uh, safe Memorial Day weekend. Everybody.